It's that time of the year when most of us suffer from coughs, sneezes, runny, and stuffy noses, sore throat, and so on. Now, a lot of names or diagnoses are often ascribed to these symptoms. You often hear about the common cold, the flu, fever, upper respiratory tract infection, pneumonia, or sometimes you even hear about double pneumonia. So what's the difference between this, and how will you know which is which? And perhaps most important, what do you do when you get these symptoms? Do you simply run to your doctor for some antibiotics? Or do you boil some ginger mixed with some array of medicinal products given to you by your granny? Well, the focus of today's show is colds, flus, and pneumonia. We have an expert part, guest panel that will unpack all we need to know about these conditions. Now, this panel is comprised of the center head from the Center for Respiratory Diseases and Meningitis from the NICD a pulmonologist and a spokesperson for Pharma Dynamics. Now, we invite you to please be part of the show by asking us some questions or simply just sharing your views with us. And the number to call is 011-714-6918 or 6919. You can also tweet us at SABC Health Talk or simply just interact with us on our Facebook page, SABC Health Talk. Sit back, relax, and learn from this exciting show coming to you just after a short break. I'm Dr. Salomit Daung, and this... Is I'll talk. Have we taken enough responsibility for our responsibilities with regards to freedom? Largely the moment of 1994, that moment of absolute magic. Firstly, the, the voting, and of course, when we watched Nelson Mandela take that oath, oath of office, mm -hmm. was a moment that we thought, well, we've now reached freedom. This is it. This is all that it can be. Up with the big story of the day where Eugenie Bouchard beat Maria Sharapova for the first time. Bouchard upped the ante and closed off the three-hour epic grudge match with a rousing performance to win the most highly anticipated match so far in this year's play season. Final score 752664. Oh! Title chases kicked on City FC, travel to Pretoria, intent on grabbing three points from a research at Super Sport United. Get all the dominating stories locally and globally on Newsroom every Monday to Friday from 9 a.m. So from Port Elizabeth, I eventually left there, joined the circus as you know and traveled. I was a singer, I was a race car driver, and I wanted to see what my chances were in America. So I started off with MTV and I started producing music because I was in the music business, you know. So I started producing musical acts with um, Black Sabbath, um, Guns N' Roses, Motorhead, and I became Wine, Women and Song. That was my life in Hollywood. A pioneer, a Crystal Award recipient, Basil Gold is a force to be reckoned with. For more inspiring stories, stay tuned to Bupilong every Friday. How many times have you dismissed sniffles as just a cold and carried on with a stuffed nose and sinuses, assuming that the symptoms would eventually run their course? Perhaps a bit more quickly with a few doses of homemade remedies. We asked people about their perception and experiences with colds and flu 
and their expectations on treatment when visiting their GPs or pharmacists. What do I think causes flu? I'm sure it's a virus. I don't think it's because swimming and with wet air and I think it's a virus that you pick up somewhere. What I think causes flu, usually it's the winter season. You get cold, sometimes you get hot at the same time. Then you take clothes, you put clothes on, then you take them off. You end up getting a virus somehow and getting the flu virus. I think it's the weather changes. Um, it's a hot and cold. Um, and I think there's a virus. This year I think it's a, it's a bad virus because I hardly get flu. And as this year, I've been affected twice now with flu. You know, when you have flu, you start by taking your mad lemon, your flu stats, and then sometimes it gets worse, sometimes it goes away, sometimes you visit the doctor then. I don't like medication. I want to be honest with you. So if it comes to finishing the course, I must be honest, I don't finish the course with antibiotics. To understand more about colds and flu, we spoke to Dr. Marlin McKay to help us understand how are people getting up for the colds and flu this season. Every year we give the message out that the best way to prevent influenza is against is with the flu vaccine. You're feeling sick, but do you have the flu or the common cold? What's the difference? Mm, what's the difference indeed? Well, we're going to learn more about that from my two special guests. Uh, first up is, you know, on my extreme right, Dr. Muramisi Mukansi, who is a specialist pulmonologist and head of ICU at uh, Helen Joseph Hospital. Welcome to Health Talk once again. Good morning, Dr. Mutaung, and hello to the, to the viewers. All right. And next to uh, Dr. Mukansi, we have Prof. Uh, Cheryl Cohen. Uh, Prof. Cohen is the center head uh, for uh, well, Center for Respiratory Diseases and Meningitis at the National Institute for Communicable Diseases, or NICD. Welcome to Health Talk, Prof. Good morning, uh, and yeah, welcome. Uh, good morning right. to the viewers. So let's let's just start off with the basics. You know, we, we said just now uh, you, many different terms, common cold, uh, fever, cough, uh, and this and that. Can we just define what an upper respiratory tract infection is, what influenza is, what a flu is, what the common cold is? And let's give it a step. <laughs> Do you want to start? Uh, well, I, I can start. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so I think, um, and you, you played a little segment there where you um, highlighted the fact that the, now is the season for, for colds and, and flu. And I think, yeah. um, so a cold is really... Um, generally a mild uh, infection of your upper respiratory tract. Now, your upper respiratory tract is sort of from the neck up your nose, your sinuses, um, sometimes your ears, uh, your throat, etc. So the, the area around your head. And usually um, a, a cold um, is associated with, with symptoms um, like runny nose, um, yeah. blocked nose, um, uh, sore throat, etc. So, so, and and it's it's not a very specific term. So, so yeah. having a cold means you've got some of these yeah. symptoms. Yeah. Um, and um, I think we'll talk about it a bit later. But the cold can be caused by lots of different um, infections, and I'm sure we'll go into it a little right. bit later in the segment. Um, now, the flu um, is is an infection caused by a specific virus, which is the influenza virus, hmm. um, and that's one of all the different. Um, bugs that can cause um, colds and flu. Right. Um, and, and the symptoms, some of the symptoms of influenza are the same as those of the common cold. Mm -hmm. um, but, but what's noticeable um, if you have the flu is that often um, it can be a more severe illness. I mean, in yeah. particular, um, it often uh, affects uh, your whole body. So you have um, what's called b body pains or, or right. tiredness, and you really feel um, like you've been knocked down. It's not just having a runny nose. It, right. it's, it's, it sort of affects your whole um, your whole system, and, and, and often you really can't get out of bed, you can't go to work um, for, for a few days. And so, so influenza is often a more uh, severe illness, um, and it can affect your whole body instead of yeah. just, just your upper respiratory tract. Um, and, and also, it, it's compared to other causes of colds and flu, it, it, it has more chance of actually going on to become right. um, something more uh, we're gonna, severe. We're going to come back to the you know, causes of it later. But Dr. Mugansi, you know, talking about the symptoms, you know, the, the, this one thing that comes up all the time is, is, is a cough. And we've heard that we're talking about infections, viral infections. Are all coughs necessarily equivalent to an infection? No, uh, a cough is really 
perhaps I should say it's a natural defense mechanism, if I put it that way. That means you are clearing up something in, in the main. It can be done by any other thing without necessarily something to clear. So if you have dust, for instance, you cough it out because that's the way to get it out of your chest. Right. And if you have an infection, you also would cough out. So if you have mm -hmm. a spit in there, you cough it out. Mm -hmm. So it's really that. Or it's sometimes it could be that, you know, you emotionally or otherwise you cough it out or you have an illness like uh, asthma yeah. and then you cough as well as a symptom so it's really a sign that uh, perhaps uh, something needs to be cleared in your airway okay so so when should one start worrying about a cough it, it it's when it's persistent and when right. it's maybe producing uh, something that's yellow yeah. and uh, it doesn't clear within a short space of time. Right. So in this case, you know, within a week, your influenza should have cleared. Yeah. And if it carries on and the color of your speech starts changing, yeah. plus it's associated with the worst symptoms, you need to worry. Right. Let's talk about another, about another related symptom, sore throat. Okay. Just take us through sore throat. I mean, does it necessarily mean an infection? Or is it, can it be part of the you know, common colds or flu? It, it could be part of the common cold or the flu or even any other severe infection. Really what it may happen from is the infection. Sometimes when there's dryness there, and remember there's glands that are there to clear up your upper airway and other parts of the body. So if ever there is infection or injury to any of those parts, then you may find that you are throat is also sore and swollen as well mm -hmm. so it uh, yeah but right. you can in, in, in context you can get it with any of the illnesses that we have except that as uh, Prof Cohen has said when it's a common cold it's milder influenza it may be severe and uh, such type of things right right we obviously are just unpacking some of these common symptoms I and mean, we'll get back to you know the real illness as such let's talk about another one a blocked nose and stuffy nose so a blocked and stuffy nose, um, it's basically, we know that our noses produce uh, secretions, we call them right. snot <laughs> sometimes, um, and, and the, the, those secretions have a purpose. Um, they, they're actually clearing out all the, the dust and, and sometimes even m m bugs or bacteria or viruses that come into a nose. Your, your body has a natural system to, to clear them, them out. But, mm. but often, um, and so a blocked and stuffy nose um, can be a sign of an infection, and, mm. and that's because if you have a, an, an infection in your nose, your body's response is to make more um, of these secretions to try and push the infection out. Right. But it can also um, be caused by lots of other things. So, so very common cause of a blocked and stuffy nose is, is allergies. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that's more common um, often in the springtime uh, where there's lots of pollen around, etc. But you can get allergies throughout the year. And, and even in the winter, a, a blocked nose could, could be as a result of a, an infection, but it could also be from, from allergies or other things. Mm -hmm. So, so what, in terms of children now, I mean, we've spoken a bit about symptoms and we're now tracking slowly back onto the illnesses. We're going to ask just now about, you know, how common these illnesses, true illnesses are. How easy is it to differentiate the symptoms in children? Or do they, children, you know, do they present different from adults? Dr. Mukansi? Mm -hmm. uh, Perhaps not a pediatrician, but I think it's a fast to say the symptoms would be the same in yeah. both adults and adults, children. Right. And the, the problem is that with the very young and the very old, it's always difficult to yeah. see the severity of the illness. So yeah. you may want to, you know, be cautious and get them seen by a health care provider and they be assessed whether there is anything complicating or not. Right. Meanwhile, an adult will definitely be able to come forward with their symptoms and present them to you and know when things are really tough and need something done. So right. that's really, but it's the same. What's with you? Let me, perhaps let's just stay with you for a while and talk about the more, we're on to illnesses now, talk about pneumonia. You know, what, how will one know that you know, this is pneumonia and how is it diagnosed? You know, obviously the symptoms of cough and the others will come together, but the, the other things would be that the cough is maybe productive, especially if it's yellow and showing pus, and then chest pain as well coming with it, which comes when you're breathing, and then the, uh, on examining the person, you find that there's signs that suggest there is a pneumonic infection, mm. so, and radiological, so you do an x-ray if you are working in places that have x-rays safe for the primary care areas, then you would be able to see the evidence of consolidation or infiltrate of infection there. Mm -hmm. So if you have that uh, conglomerate of signs and symptoms, then you're able to come up and say that this is pneumonia. Okay. In the last 30 seconds, Prof, 
how common are these true illnesses, upper respiratory tracts, the colds and the flus versus pneumonia? So, so colds and flus are, are very, very common. Like, right. Colds are, I mean, if you have young children, I have young children, you know, it's many, many times in a year that they're coming home with runny nose. And so often, you know, the one ends and the next one comes. So, mm. so they're one of the commonest infections, really, that we see um, right. in, um, you know, in, 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 in people, probably mm. the commonest. Mm. Um, the actual flu is, is also very common, in fact. Um, so up to 20% of people will probably be infected or could be exposed to infected with flu every year. So that's also very common. When you're talking flu, you're talking influenza, influenza true influenza. True influenza. All right. um, and that would be, depending on the studies, um, can be as much as 20%, which is really common. Mm. Um, and then um, when we move to the more serious illnesses, like pneumonia, which is an infection of the lower respiratory tract, those are relatively much more uncommon. So most people you know, will just recover. They won't go on to those illnesses. Um, but to put it in context, pneumonia is is one of the most important causes of death in this country. So obviously it's much less common than colds and flu, but it's still, compared to other serious illnesses, a very um, common serious illness um, in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Yeah, perhaps. Well, it's important that we understand what causes us so we we're able to deal with it. Okay, after the break, we're now going to be talking about causes and risk factors for the illnesses. Please stay with us. Kilimanjaro, majestic and mysterious. 27 climbers. 5,895 meters. Five days. Trekking in honor of Madiba and for underprivileged schoolgirls. In just five years, millions of sanitary towels have been distributed countrywide. The target to reach 2 million needy girl children by 2020. It's time that as men, we must actually pick one uh, sanitary pack. We can touch one girl through this initiative. SABC News will again be documenting the arduous expedition. The climbers have one goal in mind. To pledge support for a month's supply of sanitary pads, SMS Jillian or Tabo M to 42513. The South African team hopes to summit Uhuru, Africa's highest peak, on Madiba's birthday, July 18th. I'm Alicia Jali, joining us live from our Johannesburg studios. A quick look now with your current news leaders. The Parliament's Communications Committee has decided on five names to sit on the SABC's interim board. And the Constitutional Court has directed Social Development Minister Batabile Lamini and her department to account for their handling of the social grants contract. And in tennis, Serena Williams has withdrawn from the BNP Pariba Open in Indian Wells and the Miami Open due to a left knee injury. We're expecting it to move it just in the southern, towards the southern parts of the country, not so much uh, it coming towards uh, Southern Africa, not even touching the Mozambique channel, it's just going to move uh, back towards the Indian Ocean. Stay tuned to News Today, Monday to Friday from 3 to 5.30 p.m. Welcome back. We're talking colds, flus, and pneumonia. And with me in our studio is um, our two special guests, Dr. Murumi Simukansi, uh, a specialist pulmonologist and head of ICU at Helen Joseph Hospital, and Prof. Cheryl Cohen, head um, from the Center for Respiratory Infections and Meningitis from the NICD. Um, all right. We're talking causes and risk factors for these common colds and flus and pneumonia. But before that, let's take two calls. We'll take one after the other. Let's start with uh, Gaino from Durban. Gaino, welcome to Health Talk. Good morning to you. Hmm, your question, please. Yes, I, I had a flu about two, three weeks ago for about a week long. Right. And now, now it seems that I, I've got it back again. Right. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if that's a concern, if I need to go back to the doctor again. All right. 
or is it just uh, is it maybe the infection is all, being all along in my system and never went away? Excellent question. Very good question. We'll get the guests to respond to you if you just stay tuned in. And Thank let's you. take Luchelle from Pretoria. Luchelle, welcome. Hello, Michelle. Michelle, are you there? Yes, I'm still here. Yeah. yeah. Your, your question, please. Um, I just like to say that um, flu is a natural um, defense system. Okay? Yeah. And you have to let it run its course and balance your liquids and a hot toddy, which is whiskey. Okay. All right. Okay. All right. Thanks. We, yeah, well, <laughs> we, we appreciate your call and, and your opinion. Um, um, I'm not sure if my guests would like to respond to that, but let's see if, if they will. But thank you very much anyway. Uh, let's start with Gaino's call. So, A very important question, you know. The natural cause of these common colds and flus, um, do they come back? Should she get worried? So, so I agree. It's a really um, good question and and i think the the first thing to say is that um you know gaynor saying that she she had the flu but but most people who have the flu don't don't really have a test to see what's causing it. So, so she had a, a cold or flu. She had an upper respiratory tract infection, probably, it sounds like. Um, and what she describes is really typical of, a, of an upper respiratory infection, which is that it, it sounds like it lasted for a week and she got better, which is what we, we expect with most of these infections. And now she's um, ill again. Um, and her question is, is it, is it a new infection or not? So, so I think um, generally uh, what we know is that, that actually... Lots of different uh, uh, viruses and bacteria can cause the, the se similar signs and symptoms of colds and flu. And um, we, we, we've done a lot of work monitoring um, these infections in the community. And what we know is that, it's, especially at this time of year, which is the time when, when these infections are common, it's quite common, um, especially if you have children at home, but even if you don't, um, that you can get one infection um, and then you recover. And, and then a few weeks later, you get a different infection. Mm -hmm. um, and that's not really something to, to worry about. Yeah. Um, it, and the different infection, it can just be chance. And sometimes it is also because your body is a, a bit weakened by the first infection. So maybe you're more likely to get sick um, mm -hmm. a second time around. Mm -hmm. um, if, if, however, um, it happens that you, and, and that sounds like what's happened in this case. Sometimes, though, you, you have a cold or flu and you don't ever really recover. Um, you don't get better, and, and it, it carries on and it carries on and it persists without you getting better. Mm. And in that situation, it, it might uh, suggest that, that it's, it's gone on, the infection has gone on to, to, to become something that's more long-lasting. And in that situation, you might want to, to, to have a doctor look at it if the symptoms are really going on and on and not getting better. Mm -hmm. But if, it, if you really get better and you get sick again, the most likely thing is that you've got a different infection. To you, it looks the same, yeah. um, but it's probably a different uh, germ that's causing it. All right. In fact, I, I did say that you know, to Michelle, I'm not sure whether or not you'd want to respond, but I think that it's an important question. Um, because it talks to what people do and the remedies. I, I think she mentioned something like mix something with whiskey or something. But I'd like us to keep that at the back of our minds. When we start talking prevention and, you know, in the next segment, let's talk about some of these, uh, you know, home remedies, so, so to say. All right. Um, but let's, let's just stay with you for a while and talk about the common causes now, you know, and risk factors. Firstly, that's the risk factors. Who's, more li who's at risk, higher risk of developing these uh, colds and flus and viral illnesses? So, so by far the most common risk factor for developing um, uh, colds and flus is, is age. Right. So, and anyone who's got kids will, will know that, right? Mm. So, so young children um, are, are, are much more likely to, to develop these signs and symptoms and they develop them much more common. And, and often, um, you know, very small babies uh, maybe don't have them that often because they... they only have contact with a mom, but as soon as your child goes to kindergarten or mm. daycare, yeah. they, they're mixing with other children, they, they mix very intimately in ways adults perhaps don't get so close yeah. together, yeah. Um, and they're coming home all the time with these infections, and that's actually normal. No um, wonder they call them viral exchange bureaus. Exa exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and, and that's actually normal, and it's, it's the way that children um, get, get exposed to these viruses and build up their, their immunity. Um, yeah. th the reason why we as adults don't develop these signs and symptoms and get these infections that often is because we, we have a long history all through our lives um, yeah. of seeing them before, and our immune system, w when they're confronted by these viruses, for many of them just knocks them down and we don't get sick. So, okay. so age is the most important risk factor for, for developing colds and flu. Right. Um, there's another important consideration, though, which is when we think of risk factors, right. which is about who's at risk for, for maybe getting more severe 
illness right. um, when they get colds and flu. And, right. and that's, um, so f when we think about that, um, age is also important for that. So, so um, and I think we've already alluded to it earlier on in the show, um, that the extremes of age, so very young children, especially less than one, um, and the elderly, if they happen to get a cold or flu, they're much more likely to go on to something more severe like pneumonia than mm. if a healthy um, adult develops those colds and flu. Okay. Dr. Boganzi, I mean, yes, in all this discussion, we've been talking about viruses, 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 which suggests that, I mean, the commonest causative agents for these are viruses, a variety of viruses. We're not going to get technical and describe okay. each and every little virus. But let's try and make a distinction between the causative agents in, insofar as viruses, bacteria, and others are concerned. Do you want to perhaps make a comment yeah. and perhaps leading up to causes of pneumonia? <clears throat> yeah, I think one thing that's very clear is that uh, pneumonia can be caused by a variety of things and common amongst those would be perhaps the bacteria, then the vi then viruses and fungi and so on. So what it is is that they are related. That's why when you look at the cause of diseases, you perhaps of death in South Africa, you perhaps will see influenza and pneumonia are uh, the second commonest or the top five. So they are related. They even lead to each other. Mm. And sometimes they cause the same signs and symptoms in a human body. So you wouldn't be able to differentiate. But uh, coming to talk of what would be the common causes of pneumonia, it's perhaps bacteria. Mm. And the most common one is the one that has a name that sounds like the pneumonia, the pneumococcus. Right. That would be the one, and then there's a few others that do that. Yeah. Viruses like influenza can cause this, and if you look at it, we quite haven't seen it to say it's the most common, but in our other Western countries, the statistics that suggest that it may even supersede the pneumococcus in causing pneumonia. Yeah. So it's something perhaps for the future that we need to look at as well. Earlier, Michelle, in her call, and I just pick one of the things that she mentioned. She mentioned the immune system. Yeah. We haven't spoken about, you know, the role that the immune system plays in development of this, or <coughs> at least as, as a risk factor, perhaps. Your comment on that? Perhaps uh, she, she, she highlighted a very important thing. The, the, for instance, the bug I mentioned, the pneumococcus, stays in the human body, but it doesn't cause problems. Mm. And then as soon as your immune system is compromised, one way or the other, yeah. then it becomes a harming bug that then harms its host that they've been living harmoniously. Yeah. So the immune system plays a very important role. Right. And that means those that are, as we talk about the extremes of age, we really are talking about people that have a, in a, a dysfunctional immune system, so, yeah. so to use that word. The very young and the very old and then perhaps those that have chronic lung disease like asthma and COPD also have the problem with the immune system and yeah. the clearance. And those that have, are immunocompromised from um, the HIV as well, they mm. play a very important role. And if you look at the statistics of our pneumonia and influenza, yeah. they, 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 they come out uh, quite these things. So right. the immune system is very important. Okay. It? I wanted to slot in one question, but we've run out of time. And, and that, you know, Perhaps just to dispel this, this myth, dispel this myth that uh, the weather, cold weather, causes colds and flus. But we'll get back to that <laughs> perhaps sometime after the break. Time for a quick break. When we come back, we we'll continue our discussion on colds, flus, and pneumonia. Please stay with us. Well, a very good morning and welcome to AMU's Live at 10 hundred hours across all Central Africa regions. A fitting send-off for a revolutionary giant. A life dedicated in service of the people. The result means that uh, Swallows are out of the ABC Multiple League and drop to the amateur fourth tier of South African football, the SAB League. Tune in on AM News every Saturday and Sunday from 10 hours. It is 6 p.m. Central African Time broadcasting live from Johannesburg. This is Primetime News. South Africa said farewell to one of the Ravonia trialists, Uncle Cathy, a fearless stalwart. With this man who was so engaged, so busy, 
so witty, so funny, so wise, and so incredibly principled. Joseph Shabalala has been honored for his contribution to the South African music industry. A statue in his honor was unveiled during an annual gala dinner in Ladysmith. The shot of the day, however, belonged to American Daniel Berger, who chipped in for an eagle on the par 4 fifth hole. For all your news updates, stay on Primetime News every Saturday and Sunday from 6 p.m. Use your elbow indeed when you cough. All right, we're talking colds and flus. You've just joined us. And with me in our Johannesburg studio, we have uh, Dr. Muramisi Mukansi, a pulmonologist based at Helen Joseph Hospital. And next to him is Prof. Cheryl Cohen, center head for Center for Respiratory Diseases and Meningitis from the NICD. And it's a pleasure to welcome from our Cape Town studio, Nicole Jennings. Nicole is spokesperson for Pharma Dynamics. Welcome to Health Talk, Nicole. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. All right. Nicole, we're talking prevention of colds, flus, and pneumonia. And I think it's relevant for me to ask you about the survey that you recently did, where you obviously, you know, put the que a few questions, of, you know, to South Africans around what they're planning to do for this flu season. Do you, do you perhaps just want to share uh, perhaps the highlights of your survey with us? Yes, certainly. So we conduct the survey on an annual basis um, and we had about 1,500 respondents. And we saw that 40% um, of South Africans actually said that they plan on exploiting the colds and flu season by taking a sicky day. So that's the one side of the spectrum. Then we also saw that 17% um, of South Africans actually say that um, their employers put pressure on them or they feel pressured to go into the office even when they have a cold or a flu. And 11% of South Africans said that they actually fear that they might lose their jobs if they take sick leave. So we see a massive imbalance, you know, in, in the situation in the country. Um, and I do think, you know, people that exploit the system, that take sick leave um, when they're not actually suffering from a cold or a flu, mm. are worsening the problem. Um, and they are, you know, leading to employers sort of putting pressure on employees to go into the office when they are actually under the weather and feeling mm. sick. Mm. So are in that, I mean, people are planning to take sick leave days and that sort of thing. We're going to come back to you just now, um, um, uh, Nicole, but let's take Lee on the line from Devon. Uh, Lee, welcome to Health Talk. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Mm -hmm. Okay, I would like to know if inhaling very strong perfume or, or something like paint can cause them some of cold or flu. Because I've had problems in the past that just by smelling, by smelling paint, I get sore throat or block nose, and then I get very weak. All right. Is it related? Good question. Th thank you very much for your question, Lee. Uh, let me thank perhaps you. put it 
to Prof? So, so um, yes, a, another very good uh, question. And I think uh, the example you've given, in fact, of something like the smell of, of strong paint is a very good example of what we were talking about. Um, where where the, the, the feelings that you have, like a sore throat or a blocked nose, can be because of an infection, but many other things can cause them because it's really your body's reaction to, to something uncomfortable. So, so you're absolutely right, um, especially paint that can be quite toxic, in fact, the fumes. And if you breathe them in, they can cause the similar symptoms. So a, a sore nose, a sore throat, etc. But it's not cold and flu at all. It's not an infection. It's your body's reaction to, to a toxin or something that's, that's uh, hurting your body because it's a chemical. Yeah. Um, and so, so that's important to know. So the treatment or the management is, is different. You have to get away from it yeah. um, and, and you know, try and, and do other things to improve your, your situation. But it's not the same as you would manage an infection. Whilst they're talking about causes, you know, before the break in the last segment, I mentioned this issue around the weather and you know cold weather being a causative factor for colds flus your comment so so, so um, i think uh, people often say that cold weather causes colds and flu and i think the reason why people sometimes think this is because um, often th this is the time of the year now as we go into the winter that we see colds and flus going up um, mm -hmm. and and in fact the reason why colds and flu go up in the winter is because um, they're caused by viruses um, mostly and viruses um, are spread between people. Um, and when people are in close contact, the, the viruses spread uh, more easily. And we know that in winter, people are much more likely to huddle together in the houses. Um, you have all the windows closed. There's less ventilation. Um, and that facilitates the spread. Um, in addition, there, there are quite a few studies that show that, that viruses like the, the flu virus um, s actually survive better on, on surfaces or in the environment when it's cold compared to when it's warm. So, so there are reasons why in, in winter there's more colds and flu. But that's not the same as saying the cold causes the flu. Mm. The, the, the viruses are the cause of the infection, but the infections go up when it's cold because our behavior changes when it's cold and that uh, allows the, the infection to spread much more easily between people. All right, okay. Let's get back to Cape Town and, and speak to you again, Nicole. Now, you obviously are from uh, Pharma Dynamics, representing the, the, the pharma. Uh, oftentimes you hear people, and this relates to you know, the immune system and nutrition, uh, people generally go to pharmacies to try and get some immune boosters and some vitamins and, and whatever else that you know, gets promoted out there. Um, from your perspective, what advice do you normally give in terms of you know, what people can take in the hope that they're preventing colds and flus? Okay, so um, in the first place, I think I just want to highlight that um, a new body is actually recently taken over from the current regulator, the MCC, called SAPRA. So that's the South African Health Products Regulatory Authority. Um, and SAPRA going forward will now be responsible for the regulation of um, vitamins and supplements as well. You know, a, a form of medication that previously hasn't really been very regulated in the country. So I think that's good news for patients in general because, um, you know, they'll now be able to have more confidence in picking up a, an immune boost or a vitamin off the shelf when they visit pharmacies. Then there are, there's a very wide variety of products available out there. Um, the first thing to do is to draw a clear distinction between an, an immune booster and an energy supplement. So immune boosters will generally comp, um, contain ingredients like your vitamin C, um, often zinc and echinacea, and ingredients that are linked to um, you know, optimal immune functionality. Um, whereas your energy supplements usually contain the vitamin Bs and other types of ingredients. Um, we always advise that you speak to a healthcare provider, whether it's your, um, your doctor or your pharmacist, just to make sure that you're not exceeding the maximum daily dose of any of the ingredients. Um, and also, if you are on other chronic medication, like heart medication, for example, just to make sure that you, you, there aren't any drug interactions that take place when you, um, you know, self-medicate during the cold and flu season. All right. I have to get a comment from, from you too. Perhaps let's start with you, Dr. Vokatsi. Mm -hmm. What's your comment around the whole notion of you know, taking uh, vitamins, supplements, and <laughs> immune boosters you know, as a way of prevention? <laughs> I think obviously I have to integrate science with what commonly happens to say, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> to say that there may be a shortening of the flu, uh, these thing, episodes perhaps on those that take vitamin C and in whichever way they take it. And one of the recent studies has shown that vitamin D may help with uh, these type of things. 
And sometimes the zinc lozenges as well, apparently, they have a role. So it's really to stay healthy, hydrate yourself, yeah. and make sure what she has just said, Nicole, is that you maintain a, a balance of not over supplementing yourself right. and under supplementing. So right. there is a role for some of these things. Prof, do you want to comment? Y yes, further? I mean, I, I would agree. I think for, for some uh, of these, these uh, immune boosters, there, there is some evidence. For mm. many others, really, um, th there's not really been studies to show that if you take w X product, yeah. it's really going to reduce your risk of flu. And, and a lot of it is, is driven, I think, also by um, financial motives. Yeah. And, and people, uh, want, uh, people want something that's going to protect them. Uh, if anyone yeah. could, could build a vaccine that would get rid of all colds and flu, they'd, they'd yeah. be a multi-millionaire. Talk that about a vaccine. Let's stay there because, you know, at least in the last few minutes, we're talking prevention of the most important thing in terms of influenza is the vaccine. Just take us through how, for instance, that is determined because we're told that there's a different vaccine every year. Yeah, so, so, so absolutely. I mean, I think we should distinguish between non-specific things like immune boosters um, versus a vaccine which is really designed to, to target a specific uh, infection, which is the flu. Um, as you've mentioned, um, the, the flu vaccine um, is updated every year and it's one of those vaccines you have to have every year, which, which um, means you have to remember to go out and get it each year. The reason for that is because um, flu is, is a virus that changes very rapidly. So every year we, we know in the winter we're going to get flu and it's going to come and cause a, a season like it's causing now. But we know it will be slightly different from the flu last year. Mm. And that's because the virus is constantly changing um, to evade our immune system, our body's defenses, because it wants to keep on infecting people. And so we, we monitor at our institute the, the flu virus for South Africa. And every year uh, we use the information from, from this year really to, to decide what to put in the vaccine for next year. Mm -hmm. um, and and so, so it's quite a unique vaccine, in fact, because we, we monitor it and we update it um, every year. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, but it's important because um, it, flu vaccine really directly protects against flu, so, so it, it's, it is likely to be m uh, more effective, for example, against influenza. It can't yeah. protect against other things compared sure. to your immune boosters, okay. um, etc. Dr. Mukansi, in the last 20 seconds, we're out of time in the segment, but, but I think it's important I want us to link to, you know, that short clip that we played. Obviously, we're talking, we're not just talking about prevention of being infected, yeah. but we're talking about preventing the spread. Your yeah. few words That's on why that? the, the entity of people uh, absent, being absent from work worries me because there are those who should not mix with others when they have it. So one way is the way you cough. You should try and close the mouth and the nostrils at least, and then try and not share utensils with other people because the bugs, the virus is passed on that way. So whether it's toothbrush, mm. it's uh, other drinking things and plates and stuff during that time. Yeah, I, and, think, uh, I think this is quite important and, you know, we shouldn't rush it. Yeah. Perhaps we'll just take it further in the next segment. Okay, yeah. time for a quick break. <laughs> when you come back, we'll now talk about how we manage these conditions. Please stay with us. Tahir produced a superb performance with the ball. The protest leg spinner put his side in the driving seat, scalping three wickets for just 18 runs. Gifton Gope is flying toward third and he is there with a trip, trip, triple. His first in the big leagues. It is a Ferrari front row lockout unless Hamilton can get on pole and he can't. Ferrari for the first time since France in 2008 have locked out the front for all your sports news, keep it locked to Sports Live every Saturday and Sunday from 2030. Rights and recourse tackles constitutional issues. When South Africa became a constitutional democracy, we had a fairly sound legal system in place requiring the constitution to guide the direction in which it must go and the way in which it must be refashioned. The Justice Ministry, the custodian of human rights. We actually uh, have a, a plan to come up with a comprehensive uh, review um, of our human rights instrument. Advocates dealing with evidence. Sometimes you have to use a crook to catch a crook. 
So we expected that uh, credibility would really be taken to task. You try and consult your witnesses and prepare them as best as you can. Hashtag rights with Dumila Matez on legal issues every Sunday at 2 o'clock Central African time. Welcome back. We're talking colds, flus, and pneumonia with my three guests. The ones in Joburg, Dr. Murumisi Mukansi, a pulmonologist at Helen Joseph Hospital, Prof. Cheryl Cohen, Center Head Center for Respiratory Diseases and Meningitis at the NRCD, and in our Cape Town studio, Nicole Jennings, spokesperson for Pharma Dynamics. All right, let's start in Joburg. And uh, before we, we, we start our discussion, let's take a caller, Andy Swa from the Eastern Cape. Andy Swa, welcome to Health Talk. Andy, are you there? Andisa is not there. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll try and get back to. Okay, now we're talking about management of you know colds, flus, and, and pneumonia. Um, perhaps let's start with you, Dr. Mukansi. Um, just the principles of management. So, so, so somebody experiences these symptoms. Uh, at at what point should anybody feel that this is the time to go and consult a healthcare professional? I think just like everything else, if it's mild and when you use supportive things like painkillers and the decongestants and that and it goes away, it's always not a problem. But if it carries on and it, uh, this thing, it gives you more and more distress, you mm. better see a practitioner because there may be consequences to any illness, no matter how mild we talk about them and we classify them. You know, that's usually what we do in a discussion but in real life it can lead to anything like i said in the common cold influenza they can complicate with pneumonia mm. and maybe neurological complications you know guillain barre type of things yeah. so you can have these things complicating which means if ever it takes longer it takes yeah. about a week it should take to clear but, but it uh, means during that time you're yeah. getting better not yeah. that you're sitting and hoping that things will get better while you're not yeah. and then uh, hydrate yourself obviously and seek care and remember that the virus doesn't need an antibiotic yeah. So we give an antibiotic. Well, when we we're going to come back to that because that's see. that's a big issue. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. but what are those? Are the like flag symptoms like you know that will say to you, you know, here I need to go and see a doctor. I th I think if it starts getting worse, whatever we said, like common flu, common cold, yeah. will be mild, uh, right, this thing, runny nose and stuffiness, yeah. and maybe a sore throat. Right. And if it gets worse and you start getting muscle aches and you start getting a production of the cough and yeah. it starts giving you chest pain and then those type of it. things. It really tells you it's on a road not to getting better but to worsening and giving you other things that may be worrying. Okay. And sometimes Before we get to the doctor then, you mentioned people try certain things at home. Yeah. There's all sorts of stories around. <coughs> you know, uh, grannies pass on this wisdom from generation to generation in terms of what people can do at home. Mm -hmm. um, you often hear stories. In fact, let's go back to Michelle. Men Michelle mentioned something about boiling whiskey or know, mixing it with what. And, but she's not the only one. There are many other people that believe that you boil brandy with whatever else, ginger. And uh, your comment on these home remedies. <laughs> I think if it makes you feel better, that's fine. There's definitely no harm with most of them. Yeah. The problem is if I say is the scientific evidence for me to advise that, yeah. then I would be going uh, you know, <laughs> behind my realm. Yeah. But something that I can say they are getting from most of the remedies we're talking about yeah. is they are getting well hydrated, All right. which is something that's quite very important. And perhaps whiskey will make them sleep better. Oh, well, so. okay. <laughs> I, I thought you, you were becoming an ethical doctor, but there you go again. All right, let's cross to Kate. Keep down and speak to Nicole. <laughs> Nicole, your comment in terms of, you know, what people can do. You mentioned that sometimes they do go and, you know, uh, visit a pharmacist. In terms of, you know, the, the, the normal or your advice in terms of what people can do when they start experiencing these symptoms. Okay. First of all, um, obviously, first prize is to keep your um, immune system strong. So there's a big focus there on nutrition to make sure that you're eating, you know, well-balanced meals, getting all your vitamins. 
Um, and then of course also exercising um, regularly if that's possible for you. If you do feel like you, your lifestyle is very demanding and you're not able to um, you know, always follow a healthy, nutritious um, diet and that sort of thing, then you can consider taking um, an immune booster to just assist your immune system as well. Then I also just you know, want to um, do a call on patients to not go into the office when they are suffering from a cold or flu. Often, you know, the areas aren't very ventilated, um, so it's very easy for the, for the, um, the virus to spread. Um, and then a last call, we recently actually um, had a symposium where we focused on antibiotic stewardship. And we found that a lot of general practitioners experience pressure from patients to prescribe an antibiotic when they suffer from a cold or flu. Mm. So, you know, just a call on patients not to put pressure on their general practitioner to prescribe an antibiotic, to leave it up to their discretion to decide whether it's a viral or bacterial infection. Um, because, you know, uh, antibiotic resistance is, is a real threat and it is something that we need to focus on and we need to address. But what about pharmacists, though? Because oftentimes you hear pharmacists dishing out these antibiotics sometimes even without a script. Yes, which again, you know, I think everyone must take responsibility there. So from the patient's side, not to put pressure on their, their general practitioner um, to prescribe the antibiotic. Pharmacists should not be dishing out antibiotics without a script and patients should definitely not go to pharmacists and ask them for antibiotics. Um, similarly, you know, if one person in the family is using antibiotics, they don't finish their course and they share with the rest of the family. Mm. All of these elements contribute to antibiotic resistance. So really trust your healthcare provider, um, you know, uh, trust in their opinion on whether you need an antibiotic and then do use your medication as prescribed. Okay. Prof, I know that there's, you know, lots of professionals that watch this show. So, lots of family practitioners or general practitioners watching, watching this show. Uh, your advice to them now in terms of the criteria for prescribing antibiotics and how to deal with patients that put pressure on them. So, so I think it's a, it's a real issue, and I, I think you have two two groups of patients. You have the, the patients who put pressure on doctors to prescribe antibiotics, and you also have patients who really strongly resist antibiotics and don't want antibiotics, uh, sometimes for their children, for example, even when it might be indicated. So I think uh, general practitioners are in, are in a difficult situation, in fact, trying to navigate um, the fact that, that these days the public is, is very educated, they have access to information on the internet, and, and they come in with their own preconceptions. Um, and I think, um, so there are certain uh, signs and symptoms that doctors would look for that would suggest um, a bacterial infection more than a viral. Uh, fever may be more common in, in, in bacterial infections, although you can get it with a virus. And also often on examination, um, the doctor might see signs um, of inflammation in the ears, in the throat, um, that also would, would be more suggestive and help them to make the decision um, of its of whether it's a bacterial infection. Um, and I think um, what's really important is that the vast majority of colds and flu really don't need antibiotics. Um, and in fact, antibiotics can be harmful and they, they can have side effects, especially in children. Um, antibiotics often have gastrointestinal side effects. They cause diarrhea, they cause other rashes and other problems. So, However, when they're indicated, in other words, in, when there are signs of a bacterial infection or when the, the doctor is concerned that it might be progressing to pneumonia, so right. maybe there, there are signs of, when they listen to the chest, they hear that there's an infection in the chest of a child, for example. Mm -hmm. Those are the situations where really it's needed. And yeah. if you don't get an antibiotic, it's going to um, potentially result in worse consequences. And I think doctors really need to try and communicate uh, with their patients about the, the benefits and, and the risks um, and, and um, you know, share with them the, the, the knowledge and the evidence that they're using to make those decisions so that the patients come along with them. In one of the earlier clips we, we played, somebody mentioned, I can't finish the course. How important is it? So, so um, we, we, the, the course or the, the number of days that we give antibiotics for is done for a reason. It's really um, based on, on studies that, that have been done to show how long does it take for these antibiotics to, to get rid of the bacteria. And if yeah. you don't finish the course, what can happen is that you have these bacteria that have now they've seen this antibiotic and they've mm. developed a way of resisting it, but you haven't got rid of them. So, right. so not finishing the course is, is, is a bad thing and it can lead to, to recurrence um, with an with infection that's more difficult to treat. Okay. Before we wrap up, uh, we have some three tweets that I'd like to just quickly go over. If we could just get them, get them up on the screen as soon as possible and we um, up and going. And the first one says, after two weeks of being sick with flu, I had two days of relief and now it looks like it's about to start again. TF. 
Um, that B says, I don't want to take flu medication because I know the flu will just finish its course regardless. Immune boosters, maybe. Hmm. And Wonderland Guru says, flu vaccine, is it worth it? Hmm. Okay, that was the last tweet. And um, perhaps just give you 10 seconds each to just wrap up your final message, Dr. Mukansi. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I think we... We should uh, obviously take these things, these two diseases seriously, the influenza and the pneumonia, and try and prevent them by, especially the vaccines of influenza and pneumonia vaccine as well. Yeah. We have a pneumovac vaccine, yeah. and when we're not well, we should see our healthcare providers to help us. Yeah, okay. Unfortunately, we're not going to have enough time to go through to... Uh, firstly, let me thank you, uh, Nicole Jennings, uh, spokesperson for Pharma Dynamics. Thank you so much for your contribution and very interesting uh, study, by the way. And, of course, uh, in our Johannesburg studio, uh, Prof. Cheryl Cohen, uh, Center Head, Center for Respiratory Disease and Meningitis at the NICD. Thank you so much for your time. And, of course, as always, Dr. Mukansi, pulmonologist at Helen Joseph Hospital. Thank you for your contribution. Okay, folks. That's all, unfortunately, we had for you today. Uh, join us again next week, same time, on SABC. And please keep on sending us those comments on, on our Facebook page. And, yeah, thank you so much for your calls. Thank you for your tweets. And please, please do take care. Bye-bye. Thank you.